Yes, but the disaster causing chaos once again. Biniam Gomai not happy with him after this sprint. This is the Tour de France Stage 7. We've had some absolutely cracking stages up until now. And you know what? I need a rest, and so does the peloton. I can't be doing in-depth videos of all these tactics every day. Let's just have a standard sprint stage in Bordeaux, and that's what we had today. No crosswinds, no nothing, not even a dangerous breakaway, because when the four teams that thought about getting in the break, Total Movistar, UnoX, and Arcade got in there, got blocked up, looks like it's gone happy days, then the DSs started saying to three of those riders in the break, actually, don't bother, it's a waste of energy. So UnoX backed out of it, bit strange. Then Oliveira got the call down from up on high. He backed out of it. And then after the easiest day ever to get in the breakaway, Bergado got told to back out of it. So maybe they just didn't want their riders to spend, you know, five hours, four hours frying themselves in the sun and 35 degrees. Or maybe they hate TV exposure. It's the best Total's probably going to get this Tour de France. Danish friends having a chat in a very relaxed peloton. Uh, yeah, and so Guglielmi was the only brave soldier to go up front. He got six minutes Lotto and Alpsen put riders up front, but then it was Lotto bringing that gap down. They put three and Alpsen kind of disappeared because, yeah, it's one rider in 35 degrees on a flat stage. Intermediate sprint, again, Philipson looking good, decent lead out from Van der Poel. Benny was pretty sprightly. Legs, Lecoq actually third again. He's look out, look out for him in Limoges tomorrow. But yeah, Benny won that sprint. Whether they go full on these intermediates, I'm not sure, but again, Binny's another one for tomorrow's stage. Actually, it could be very dangerous. And the, the gap started coming down. And then after the intermediate, Nance Peters and Pierre the Latour bridged across to Guglielmi, who would have been happy to see some company. And quick step started pacing. So obviously, Fabio Jakobsen felt all right, or up to sprinting with the clerk on the front controlling the gap. And also, Jayco had uh, a rider up there for Groenewegen. But Cavendish, he changed bike at around 55Ks or so. He did that a lot when he was on Quickstep as well in 2021. He changed bike a lot around 50Ks before the sprint. And now the GC teams come to the front, or at least a fair few of them. So Alberson and Quickstep disappear for a while. And this is a funny moment. Dylan van Baarle, he's the Dutch national champion. He's getting a bid on. Van Hoedok's moved across to get a bid on on the only climb of the day. But he's in front of the Uno X train. And he looks exactly like the Uno X riders. Goes out to get a bid on. And the soigneur tucks it back because he thinks he's on Uno X. And Dylan van Baarle was, was not, that, not that happy. He seemed, and then he waves to the next Swanyo, I need a bid on it, it's 35 degrees. He's also about to perform a pretty similar front now, useful or essential function for Vingegaard, keeping him safe in what was a very hectic technical finish. Thankfully, no crashes. Uh, they, they changed the three-kilometer rule. Anyway, right goes to the front. He looks around. He's like, where are my teammates? I've just come to the front. Now I have to go back, get them again, bring them up to the front again with Bauhaus, I think he's their best chance for a stage win at this Tour de France because Lander's not looking too good anyway. And yeah, you see, it's a mixture of GC teams, three on the right with UAE, Jumbo, Ineos, and then sprint teams with Astana, Lotto Destiny, and Bahrain. But Alperson are a little bit deeper. They're kind of biding their time. They don't want to spend their biggest too early. Van was at the back. He didn't contest the sprint today. And it starts to really heat up in the last 12 kilometers. A lot of road furniture. Vingegaard's kept in front position, but for his opponent's benefit as well, he got to freeload Tanu Pogaccia off the Yumbo Visma train. They actually used Christoph Laporte. Despite Van Aert not sprinting, Laporte was used basically just to position and keep Vingegaard safe. But with Pogaccia nestled in just behind Vingegaard, he gets the benefit of that uh, strong ruler work too. He eventually did get shuffled back though, and is coming up to where the three kilometer rule was oh, changed. And you see like when you're contesting or trying to take up positions, he left a gap open as he was sliding back in front of him. And then he tries to accelerate back into that gap. And that's, that's a big no, no, because the sprint, the guys going for the sprint, they come across him and just like they're like, that's my gap. I don't care that you're Tadej Pogacar. I'm trying to win a Tour de France sprint or help my teammate win that Tour de France sprint. And yeah, 3.2 k's to go. They're past the where the GC times would be taken if there was a crash. And the port's like, well, I'm on the front. And this is Alberson eventually move up. And the, the death of the pure sprint lead out is never been more stark than at this Tour de France. You've got Merku on the front basically already for Fabio or another, maybe Asgrim. Fabio's losing wheels backwards. And it's really only Alperson here with a serious top-level lead-out. The others are kind of, no one can find each other, and everyone's, I mean, Lotto have had injuries to two of their main guys, so they get a free pass. They actually have been doing well despite that. But it's really Alperson and the rest, because Quickstep look a shadow of themselves in the lead-out department at the moment. You see Ewan 
uh, fighting for Philipson's wheel. Du Bois moves up, says a word to Ewan. This is with 1,800 metres to go, and tries to move him up, but it's too early to do a lead out, and Ewan doesn't follow him. We saw that in Balois, the Belgium tour. Ewan didn't really follow Du Bois, and maybe he would have won if he did, but Alberson have got this lockdown. Van der Poel, though, he's going to be left to go too early. It's Jonas Rickard on the front, Philipson's in the green jersey. Remember, everyone's fighting for their wheel, and 920 He's lucky Van der Poel that Van Poppel comes to front. Magus has lost his wheel. We see Groenewegen deeper in the group. Jakobsen's way out of position. Cav is deep. He's on Groenewegen's wheel near Cockard. Wellsford's being brought up on the left-hand side, but he did too many efforts and got left in the wind, and that was kind of his sprint over already with 600, 700 metres to go. And Van der Poel launches at 650. And unlike the other stages, this wasn't perfect timing from Alpsen. But the problem for the other teams is, you know, Groenewegen gets dropped off here. There's no other leadouts left. There's no Van Poppel to bring Mayus up the right-hand side quickly as Van, Van der Poel dies on his run and leaves Phillips in a little bit too early. And you see Binny on Mayus' wheel. Pedersen makes a big mistake here. You see he's, he's on Phillipson's wheel. He goes and undercuts him. You'll see it better in the long extended overhead. Undercuts him to the other side. But with MVDP moving over to the right, as we look at it, this opens up the space for Cav. And just like in UAE Tour last year, he launches early. Problem is, I don't know if this bump here, as he launches, messed up his gears or what happened there. Certainly he didn't expect that bump, but he comes with speed, real top end speed. Binny goes for his wheel. Philipson shuts him off to the right-hand side and then comes back out of the wheel to win his third sprint stage in a row. No one else had a look in. Here's the overhead, though, because we've got to talk about that Philipson move, another one, third stage in a row. We see Pedersen came under Philipson. MVP moved to the left. That's Pedersen's sprint over. He basically boxed himself in. Of course, Philipson's not going to yield Van der Poel's wheel, but Cav launches here, and Philipson sees him. Binny's already getting himself up to speed, sprinting straight. Philipson is like, well, it's too early for me to jump straight in the wind, and he jumps diagonally across and just goes straight for Cav's wheel. And this is where it's like, he deviates, he's already, everyone's sprinting, and he does basically, Binny either has to break or stop pedaling, or he gets chopped and crashes into the barriers or has his front wheel obliterated. So yeah, he made a business decision, Binny. Not much more he could do. Philipson wasn't relegated by the letter of the law. Of course, it's an obvious relegation, but the the comment says just don't have the cojones to relegate anyone if there's no crash and the guy wins the stage. It's a lot easier like they did the other day. Oh, I'll relegate Van der Poel because he barged Binny, but he didn't win the stage, so it doesn't really affect anything. Or relegate Schiel Merza when, like, who cares? It didn't change anything. But yeah, Philipson wins his third stage. He looks like the best sprinter here. He is the best sprinter here. His GC standings unchanged. Jonas Wungagot still 25 seconds ahead of Tadej Pogacar. Hindley with a nice buffer of 90 seconds or so ahead of fourth in that third podium slot, which he'll be fighting for tooth and nail. Hope you enjoyed the video. We've got an uphill sprint in Limoges tomorrow, and I'll see you with a recap of that then. Ciao.